Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight I'm continuing in the study of the book of John. Uh, in fact, I'm going to conclude the study of the book of John. Uh, tonight I hope to get through the entire chapter 21. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies on uh, John, uh, please go back and watch it from the beginning. I really believe the Gospel of John is the most important book of the entire Bible. So, uh, let's begin now. Uh, John chapter 21, verse 1. I'm a KJV firstist, so I will read it first in the KJV. But I will also look at it in the Amplified Translation, uh, because it, it's kind of like a, a translation commentary combination. So sometimes I find that to be helpful. Now, John chapter 21, verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the two other of his disciples. So, we already have, uh, um, in chapter 20, two, I believe there's two cases, uh, two times, that Jesus appears to, uh, oh, the, 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 the apostles, the disciples, and, and then uh, the first time, Thomas, who we can call Doubting Thomas, uh, was not there. And uh, when he was told about Jesus' resurrection, he didn't believe it. And then the second appearance, Thomas was there. And it's a very dramatic scene where uh, Jesus tells Thomas to, Here, now that you've seen me, you believe. Here, touch me. Uh, stick your fingers in my wounds so you can believe. But, but those people who never see me and yet believe, blessed are those. Advantage are those. Happy are those. And I'm one of those. I, I believe in Jesus. I believe uh, who he is, what he's done for me, and his death, burial, and resurrection. I believe all that, even though I haven't seen him and touched him. So that's what, that's what Jesus is asking you to do. Believe in him. Uh, depend on him for your salvation. And so we're seeing these numerous uh, ev events, these resurrection appearances. In fact, in... Uh, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's known as the resurrection chapter. And uh, Paul says that uh, um, that Jesus appeared to uh, over a 40-day period to over 500 witnesses, and he, and he lists um, the various people and the times that he's appeared. So uh, now we see the same thing here in uh, John chapter 21. Uh, it, it's, it's showing the various times Jesus appeared in the uh, bodily. Let me read these first few verses in the Amplified. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias in Galilee. Uh, and he did it in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas, who is called Didymus, the twin, and Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, as well as John and James, the son of Zebedee, uh, and two others of his disciples were together. Uh, so, uh, it's, you see, this is a, this is not only um, a gospel account, an account of uh, uh, the, um, the, the, the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus, this Gospel of John, uh, all the Gospel accounts are, are um, telling us the same kinds of things from a perspective of a, four different people. Um, and the book of Acts is also a historical record of this um, uh, resurrection of Jesus and ascension of Jesus and then the beginnings of the church, the Acts of the Apostles is the technical, the actual name of that book. Um, and then in 
as I said in First Corinthians chapter 15, it, it also is giving us a, a hysterical record of verification, um, uh, reaffirmation of this uh, resurrection and the many times he appeared to so many people over a 40 day period. And it's this resurrection that is, is really what um, kind of jump starts the church because without the resurrection, the, it, it never would have happened because um, the, the, the apostles were hiding out in fear for their lives until the resurrection. The resurrection transformed them from cowards into courageous, bold witnesses uh, testifying of this bodily resur resurrection uh, at, the, at the cost of their lives. So now let's look at this in KJV verse uh, 3. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Well, we have to ask, why didn't they know it was Jesus? Well, maybe he was such a distance away they couldn't recognize him. Or maybe it's an example again of Jesus uh, uh, concealing his identity, uh, either um, um, making them not uh, not be able to see his actual appearance or maybe changing his appearance as I said in the previous chapter uh, kind of like in science fiction a shapeshifter where he actually changes how he looks uh, whatever is the cause uh, for this they don't recognize him at this point um, and now uh, verse 5 then Jesus saith unto them children have ye any meat? They answered him, No. Let me read verse 5 in the Amplified. So Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish to eat along with your bread? They answered, No. Okay. Um, but he refers to them as children. I wonder how they felt about that. Uh, they didn't know who he was. Uh, could it be that they thought he was a very old man and, and he was using that kind of language because they were much younger? Uh, we, we know that they were children because they were um, children of God because of their faith in, in the Savior. Um, but I don't know if they put two and two together at this point. I guess they didn't because they didn't really yet acknowledge this is Jesus, as you'll see uh, in the coming verses. Um, Verse 6, And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. That must have struck them as odd, some stranger from a distance telling them, If you just cast your net on the right side of the, the boat, then you'll catch some fish. Uh, that must have aroused their curiosity at that point. Who is this that thinks they can tell us? All we got to do is throw the net on the right, and we'll catch fish. I, I, I was think that their suspicion would be already aroused at this point. It says, They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. So, I mean, obviously this doesn't happen every day. This is another a miracle, as Jesus has done so many times before. And so, what happens next? Verse 7, Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, the disciple whom Jesus loved, of course, we've already um, explained earlier how this is a, a kind of a title uh, for a John, the Apostle John, who's, who's the writer of this uh, gospel account. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. So, I don't think he visually recognized him at the point. He just put two and two together and realized this has got to be the Lord. This is a a miracle that we've just uh, uh, participated in, and it must be Jesus. Uh, so he said, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked. Now I don't know if he's naked completely, or if this is just a, uh, a loose use of the language, where, where he was shirtless and maybe wearing just his underwear. Uh, 
or perhaps he really was naked. But he says he girt his fisher's coat unto him. So he put more clothes on because he wasn't fully clothed or maybe even completely naked and did cast himself into the sea. Let me read verse 7 in the Amplified. Then that disciple John, whom Jesus loved or esteemed, said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer tunic, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea and swam ashore. Okay, verse 8 in the KJV. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, uh, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. I want to read that if me turn my fan down. Uh, I'll read verse 8 in the Amplified. But the other disciples came in the small boat, for they were not far from shore, uh, only about a hundred yards away, dragging the net full of fish. Verse 9. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish were laid thereon, and bread. Of course, uh, fish were already on the grill, being cooked. So, uh, obviously, uh, Jesus hadn't gone fishing. They hadn't yet brought the fish in and given Jesus fish to cook, and yet Jesus had fish cooking. So, another example, as, as he made the, the, the fish, from the, from the few fish he fed thousands. Um, and now, another example of him pulling, apparently, fish out of thin air. So then it says, um, uh, verse 10, Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. I think some people draw some uh, you know, significance of this number 153, but I, I don't know what it is. And, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Um, maybe it's the number 153 is given so that we can know that uh, this is a precise story. It's we're not speaking in general terms. This is an exact telling of the story. Uh, and to uh, lending more credibility that this is a, this we're getting the tour story just as it actually happened. And also 153 fish, that's a great number of fish, and, and backing up the, the case that there was a huge catch. Um, and now verse 12, uh, uh, again, it, it says, yet was not the, was, was not the net broken. So, the, uh, with that many fish, it seemed like the net could not support the weight and would have been torn apart, and yet it wasn't. So, not only were they able to catch a huge number of fish, because Jesus said, cast your net to the right, but the net held together, and it shouldn't have. Apparently, it should not have been able to support that many fish. So, another example of uh, this being all part of this great miracle. Verse 12, Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Um, apparently they still weren't close enough yet uh, to recognize him. Or his, his they, 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 as I said, he either, it was a great distance and they didn't recognize him, or they were kind of, um, um, God did not allow them to visually recognize him or his appearance was changed uh, so they would not recognize him but they they did identify them and, and were confident that it was the Lord um, uh, verse 13 Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise let me read verse 12 in the Amplified Jesus saith to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? I mean, if they could see him 
and and his appearance was the appearance of Jesus, then 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 the statement wouldn't make any sense. So they either couldn't see him because of the distance. Uh, at this point, they still were too far away. They knew without any doubt that it was the Lord. Uh, maybe they also knew without any doubt because he had already appeared to them so many times. They were accustomed to the, him appearing in this way. Um, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. Uh, verse 14 in the KJV. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. So as I said earlier, he had appeared to them and then he appeared another time where, where Thomas was present, and now the third time. Verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. Um, So he's not only asking Simon Peter if he loves him more than anyone else, more than the others, the greatest love. But then when he says yes, he says, then feed my lambs. He's giving them some kind of a, a role to play. It's your responsibility to feed them, not feed them with fish and bread, I don't think, but feed them spiritually, to be like a shepherd over them, to be like a pastor of them. He's giving them, he's giving him some kind of a, uh, a, a position, uh, a ministry. Verse 16, he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. Okay, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Is there a distinction between a lamb and a sheep? I think a lamb is just a younger sheep. Um, and then verse 17, he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Well, we can only speculate why uh, Jesus asked him this question three times. Uh, could it be that um, Peter was asked three times if he knew Jesus, and he denied him. He denied knowing him, denied being one of his disciples. And then the cock crowed, and Jesus had prophesied that that's exactly how it would happen. And Peter was, of course, very much ashamed. Uh, and now he he's asked three times, does he love Jesus? And, of course, he says each time, yes, I love you. And, but so, so is there some kind of connection between these Peter denying the three the Lord three times, and now the, the Peter acknowledging his love, confessing his love, proclaiming his love for Jesus three times. Let me read this in the Amplified see how it phrases it. Um, starting with verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. So John, I guess, is a, a, another name for uh, Jonas, as it says in the KJV. <clears throat> Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others do? Oh, okay. With total commitment and devotion. Oh, okay. So according to the Amplified, the question is, do you love me more than the other people love me? Is your love that great? Uh, I thought in the, when I read the KJV, do you love me more than these? I thought he, Jesus was asking Peter, do you love me more than you love the other the disciples? But in the Amplified, 
it uh, becomes more clear. I, I, I would say that I, I would lean towards this interpretation. Um, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others do with total commitment and devotion? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you with a deep personal affection as it for a close friend. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Again, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me with total commitment and devotion? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you with a deep personal affection as for a close friend. Jesus said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me with a deep personal affection for me? As for a close friend, Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you really love me with a deep personal affection? As for a close friend. And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you with a deep personal affection. As for a close friend, Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Well, I think there was something to be gained by reading that uh, amplified translation. Uh, now let's go back to the KJV verse 19. No, verse 18. Jesus speaking. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This he, this spake he signified by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. So verse 18 is Jesus's prophetic utterance about the fate of Peter, how uh, he says, when you're young, you gird yourself, you clothe yourself, you wrap yourself up, but and you walk wherever you want, you're free. But when you get old, you'll stretch forth your hands, and another will gird you, you will be like handcuffed, you'll be tied up, and you'll be forced to go where you don't want to go. Uh, so he will be arrested, imprisoned, and then executed. This is the prophecy, and that's exactly how it happened with Peter. Verse 19, this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeing, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following. That's a reference to John which also leaned on his breast at supper, at the Last Supper. John was sitting next to him, listening so closely, and, uh, and saith, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? So it's a reference to, uh, he's asking him, well, what about John? What's his fate? Verse 21, Peter seeing him saith, uh, seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. So Peter, as usual, asks, blurts out what he thinks, asks the questions that come to his mind. Without any kind of hesitation or filter, he says, Okay, you're telling me my fate. Well, what about John's? And Jesus says, Well, uh, if, if he lives until I return, what is that? What is that to you? Mind your own business. You follow me. You've got your own ministry, your own mission. Uh, let me read these verses in the Amplified. Verse 18. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and walked wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and arms and someone else will dress you and carry you where you do not wish to go. Now he said this to indicate the kind of death which Peter would glorify God. And after saying this, he said, he said to him, follow me, walk the same path of life that I have walked. 
Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back on his chest at the supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? So when Peter saw him, he asked Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? What is his future? Jesus said to him, if I want him to stay alive until I come again, what is that to you? You follow me. All right, back to the KJV, verse 23. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. That's a reference to John uh, and, the, and, the, and the statement that, that uh, Jesus made to Peter about John's future. He says, then went this abroad. So this was commonly repeated and, and believed. Uh, that that disciple, John, should not die. Yet Jesus said uh, not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? So Jesus is not saying John will not die, he'll be alive when I return. But he's saying that uh, if, if that's what I want to do, why, who is, what is that to you? It's really none of your business. None of your concern. You have your own responsibilities as, as, uh, as a, my minister. Verse 24, this is the disciple which testifies of these things. This is John saying, I'm the one that's, that witnessed all these things, who's writing this letter, these things, and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. So he's saying, I'm the one that witnessed all these things, I'm this, this disciple that's referenced here, and, and I'm the one that's writing down these things, and I guarantee you, everything I've written down is true. Verse 25, and there are, all, there are also many other things which Jesus did, that which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Kind of a similar ending to uh, the previous chapter, talking about all the things that Jesus uh, did, not only in his incarnation and his ministry, but uh, throughout all eternity. If, if we everything was written that Jesus did, that, that God has done, it, you know, the whole universe couldn't contain the books. Um, All right, so, well, that's the, the end of the book of John. Well, let, let me kind of sum up the 21 chapters. Um, I've said this throughout this study. I've said this over and over again over the last eight years on YouTube. In many videos, I've made this point that there are 66 books in the Bible. They all serve a great purpose. But if I was delegated to pick one of them, in other words, let's say that every book of the Bible on the entire earth, all the records of the Bible in every form, written on, on the internet in any way, every record of the Bible would be destroyed, save one book. Which book would you save? And I would choose this book, the Gospel of John. I, that's how important I think this book, I think it is uh, more important than any of the others. Of course, there are many other books that I, I, I cherish. I, I, I cherish all of them in, in, in their own way. But um, they, they all serve their own purpose. But the purpose of John rises above all the others. The first chapter of John, we learn about the deity of Christ, the eternality, that he's an eternal God Almighty. He's not a creature. And then throughout the book of John, we hear 99 times, believe, 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 believe. Not one time in the book of John does it say, repent of your sins. The word repent doesn't even appear in the word the Gospel of John. 
You hear, but it says over and over again, believe, believe, believe. So the message of John is, Jesus is eternal God Almighty, our Savior, who died for our sins and raised was raised from the dead, and you need to believe in him for your salvation. It doesn't say you need to believe in him and get water baptized. It doesn't say you need to believe in him and, and stop sinning. It, it doesn't say you need to believe in Jesus uh, and anything else. It simply says, believe in Jesus. That's the one requirement that's repeated over and over and over again. And then chapter 20, verse 31, John states, the reason I'm writing this book, the whole point of this book, is to educate you, to, so you so you can learn that you you receive eternal life by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Believe He's the Son of God, the Christ, your Savior. Believe in Him for your salvation, and you receive eternal life. That's the whole point of the book. No other book of the Bible claims that the purpose of its writing was to teach us how to get saved. So that's that's why I think this book is so important. And if I tell everybody, if you're a brand new Christian and, and uh, you want to start reading the Bible, please read the Gospel of John over and over and over again before you attempt to, to read anything else. It's very easy to get confused if you start reading the Old Testament first, or even if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke first, uh, and it's easy to get confused. Just read the Gospel of John over and over, 10 times, 20 times, and then it will be so ingrained into you who, he, who Jesus is and the means of salvation. Believe in Jesus for your salvation, and you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. Uh, that should be just so ingrained in you it, it, it's you, you don't have any doubt and nothing else should confuse you. And then all the other books of the Bible, as you read uh, the book of Acts and, uh, and Hebrews and James and, and Paul's epistles and Galatians and, Hebrew, and uh, uh, you know Romans and all these other books, every other book should be measured against John and, and interpreted in, in light of John through the, through the lens of John. John says, all that is required of you to go to heaven is to believe in Jesus. Not believe that he's a real historical figure. Not to believe that he, you know, he, he really lived and that, uh, and even that he's God and he died for our sins. Roman Catholics believe he's the son of God. He died for our sins. He rose from the dead. But they don't have salvation unless they believe in him for their salvation. I made this distinction many, many times. I ask you, answer this question. Uh, do, you, do you think you're going to go to heaven? Not only do you think you're going to heaven, do you have any certainty? Do you feel certain? Are you absolutely confident you're going to go to heaven? Most people don't have that kind of confidence. They got their fingers crossed, hoping, well, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm hoping. And then the follow-up question is, well, why? Why do you think you should go to heaven? If God asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? God said, plead your case. Why should I let you into heaven? Most people are going to plead good works. They're going to say, God, I've, I've done really good. I, 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 I've been a pretty darn good person. I know I've done a few bad things in my life, but I'm not as bad as most people. And I've done given to charities, and I, I'm religious. I attended church. I even got baptized and went to confession. I take communion. did all those things. Most people will plead their case to God based upon the, all the good things that they've done. And that's the way Roman Catholics, that's the faith of Roman Catholicism. That's the faith of lordship, salvation, works, salvation. That's all the religions of the world are based upon personal merit, saying, let me into heaven because I'm good enough. But that's not what the book of John says. And that's not what the Apostle Paul says. That's not what the Apostle Peter said. And, and uh, John, Peter, Paul, and Jesus all agreed. The one thing you must do is to put your faith in Jesus. And now, if you're 
arguing to God, let me into heaven because of what I've done. You're not, your faith is not in Jesus. But if you go before God and he says, why should I let you into heaven? And you say, because of Jesus Christ, period. I'm trusting in him. Um, I believe the Bible's true and, and I believe what he said is true. He is my savior God. He died for my sins and he rose from the dead to prove his claims are true. And I'm trusting him. My confidence is in him. I'm relying completely on Jesus and what he's done for me. I believe his promises that he'll give me eternal life in heaven. I believe he's faithful to keep the promise. So that's what you learn from the book of John. And uh, once you've learned that, then you can test all the other scriptures uh, through that lens. If it doesn't agree with that, then you, you don't don't get conflicted and say, well, John must be wrong. Or, no, instead say, I don't understand this statement in Matthew. I don't understand this statement in James. It doesn't agree, it seems to agree. It doesn't mean that uh, faith in Jesus is insufficient just because you read somewhere else that faith without works is dead. All it really means is that you don't understand the verse, faith without works is dead. You don't understand the book of James. You don't understand the book of Matthew if you if you are conflicted. That's why I urge you, read John over and over and over again and have confidence that faith in Jesus is the sole requirement. And Jesus' death on that cross is a sufficient payment for your sins. Nothing else is required. And... Uh, as you go through the Bible, hopefully for the rest of your life, and you continue studying, and hopefully you'll, you'll continue watching all my videos and, and, and these other uh, books of the Bible, these other verses in the Bible that cause people a lot of confusion. Uh, I, I've made a great effort to try to explain those so that in, in light of John. All right, thank you for, thank you for watching. And uh, as I said, if you have not seen this, study from the beginning, please go back and start with John chapter 1, verse 1. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.